Hi class, we've we reached the um, last live lecture with me, and for those of you that have been watching the live lectures, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you found this class informative and helpful and supportive for your future endeavors as a clinician and what's ahead for you um, as you deal with sex quite often in session um, with people, um, whether it be couples, individuals, dealing with situations with children, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot um, with this subject matter that you will face as a practitioner, and so it's really important to start to become um, comfortable discussing it, having hard conversations about it, um, even trying to navigate what situations mean to people um, as they try to figure out what's going on for them personally. Um, and so I hope that this course helped prepare you to some degree when you are, I mean, this is, I mean, it sounds, sounds so cliche to say like once you're actually practicing, then you're going to have a better idea of, of, um, how to handle things, but that there is some truth to that. Like once you get into situations and then you start to get a feel for it, it is helpful. However, um, it is important that you feel prepared, whether that's by reading material, studying things, what we're talking about in class to realize maybe some of the things you will discuss. It is important for you to, to feel a sense of preparedness. It's okay to have some nervous feelings. It's okay to be nervous about talking about sexuality, intimacy, trauma, um, assault, um, trying to, for people to discover some things about themselves. It, it's okay to have some nervousness or anxiousness involving that because yes, like no one knows all the things, right? And in and, and, and all aspects of knowing things, not just in sexuality um, or sex or whatever. <clears throat> but it's, it's important that you talk about these things with your supervisor, fellow colleagues. Hopefully this class gave you a little bit of perspective and some hope when facing these situations. Hopefully some of the blackboards caused you to really think and see how you would um, respond to clients. I think I just need to remind you, like no matter your own personal background, your own life experiences, when your client comes into your office, it's about them and their own personal life experiences and their situations and their personal traumas, not yours. So please keep that in mind. Be conscientious of countertransference. Um, you're meeting the person where they're at. Um, it's not our job to direct them where to go. It's just our job to come alongside them in that process, okay? I just can't reiterate that enough. So um, a few things that we're going to talk about here in week seven um, is sexual, like sexual intimacy after infidelity, uh, which that can be really difficult to face. Um, there's some great books out there right now. Um, one of them is a little older. It's Hold Me Tight, and that's by Sue Johnson. Talks about emotional focus therapy, which that might, if you're really interested in working with couples, that might be a therapy that you really um, gain a lot of information on and maybe get some specializations and trainings on. I think Dr. Nab, who um, worked with the ops program and is now the doctor, I think the lead on the doctorate program, the CID program at Cal Baptist, um, I believe he's trained in EFT and sometimes they offer trainings, I think even at the university. Um, but just getting back in touch with like, how do we recover from a wound of an affair? And that can look very broad. Um, that can be um, a physical affair. Um, nowadays, that can be an emotional affair. Um, that's reconnecting through social media, reconnecting through um, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter. I mean, all kinds of things. Maybe it's finding dating apps on a partner's phone. Um, maybe it's, um, an emotional relationship that's been developed at work. Maybe some people see infidelity pornography. Um, it's really subjective to the client, right? And, and that can be a hard recovery, you know, and trust. When you talk about vulnerability, there's a lot of vulnerability in sex. And when you talk about having a violation of trust, it is hard to be vulnerable again. Um, you know, a, a Client finding out information of a partner having a physical relationship with someone else can be very damaging to whatever may be left of their own physical relationship. Um, a lot of times when people find out that their partner's cheated, they want all the gory details of what happened between them and that person. Highly, highly do not recommend that. 
Um, because once you have that information, it's very difficult to get that information out of your head. Um, sometimes people think like, the more I know, the better I can understand. And it's like, the more you know, then you're, you're stuck with the more you know. And that can be very debilitating for people. I have clients that have done that. And then, then they're like, I wish I hadn't had done that because that just messed me up. And I understand that because now you're stuck with those visualizations that probably are made up in your head, but you're interpreting things that have been said to you. And now it's just making it worse. Um, so when couples face infidelity, um, are dealing with it, want to stay together, but work through it. One of my suggestions is obviously therapy and sticking committed, staying committed to it. Not just one session. One session is not going to work through that. <laughs> um, probably a commitment of six months, maybe to work through that situation, to start rebuilding trust. Um, and, and that might take time. Um, sometimes people after an infidelity and finding out about them might become hypersexual as a way of almost kind of claiming their stake. Um, like they, they want to mark their territory or something, but then there's a regression after that. Um, it happens. Um, and so couples talk about this. Um, don't be shocked. That's not something that's uncommon, but I think it's then working through how do we rebuild trust? How do we regain intimacy? You know, no relationship is perfect, but no relationship is perfect. And then there's an affair. So it takes two people to be in a relationship and I'm not excusing affairs. There's nothing okay with having an affair. However, more than likely there was problems in the relationship before the affair. So those things have to be addressed too, because more than likely there are some reasons that someone sought out attention. Now, some of you may think like, you know, oh, I'm going to have you have a really hard time with this because of maybe prior circumstances or your own personal stories. We've got to make sure we keep that in check, especially if you're seeing a couple, you want to be very objective. Um, you want to be clear on what your, um, what, what the goals are and what you're trying to do. Um, but you really want to keep yourself in check. And so if that's part of your story, just making sure that you're talking that through with your supervisor or anyone else will be that that's involved, um, with your process. As far as when seeing clients, that will be very important. Um, but you want to make sure you stay objective. So both people feel comfortable in the session room. Um, it, it's, it's really hard, um, work to recover from something like that, but it can be done and it can be even better than it was before. Um, and so just being patient with clients as they work through that, encouraging their own patience, their own grace. Sometimes after a person has spilled their guts and confessed to an infidelity, then it's as if they want the person who just is gathering that information to, um, just bounce back from it automatically. And that's just not how it works. And um, they're like, I'm over this. Why can't you? And it's like, well, you've had all this time to think about this, do on it, you know, all, all the things before telling. And now you want that person to be where you're, you are. And that's just not reality. So good, good work can be done. Um, it just is, it takes time and, and it's healing and forgiving and moving forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of life transitions when it comes to intimacy, especially in a relationship, a long-term relationship, marriage, transitioning into parenting, um, having your first baby, all the things that go with that exhaustion, um, a woman's body, it doesn't feel like her own, especially if she's breastfeeding, just gave birth. Um, there can be a disconnect. It's all about the baby. Um, I think there's just a lot of transition when you become a parent, um, and so trying to navigate that with couples to be patient with their partner, um, trying to figure out too, if physically everything feels okay when they're allowed to have intimacy again, um, after having a baby, trying to navigate, you know, um, <clears throat> does everything feel like it's working properly and doing things right? Hormones are a big issue right after having a baby. So what are the hormonal situations going on? Um, you know, intimacy might feel different if there's a baby in your bedroom, <laughs> you know, like there's all these things that can play a role, you know, and then as kids grow, you know, this is why we see a lot of um, relationships kind of end after raising children because parents lose sight of each other in the midst of raising their kids. Sorry, my hand is like moving back and forth so much. And so we got to encourage parents to still stay connected despite raising children. Really, children shouldn't come first. It, because in the long run, you're hopefully still going to be with your partner. 
Um, your kids are with you maybe 18 years this day and age, maybe longer, but still they're adults at some point. If you don't stay focused on the two of you, you'll lose sight of that. And it will just be about your kids and then your kids are gone. And then it's like, who is this person? Um, and so it's important for couples to stay engaged, stay in, in connected, stay intimate with one another. Um, intimacy is a huge part of a long-term relationship of a marriage. And so making sure when you're talking with couples that you're addressing these things, trying to navigate how do we make time for sexual intimacy? Um, how do we make time for emotional intimacy? You know, there was this, um, when I was in human sexuality, I think I may have discussed this earlier, but again, men, men are like microwaves. They can be ready to go at any time. Women are like the cockpit of a, of a airplane and there's all these gauges and buttons and knobs and elevation and all this stuff. And it's a way, it's a way more of a process for women when it comes to sex. And so if needs aren't being met in other ways, it might be hard to have needs met sexually, um, you know, to give and a take. And so trying to navigate that, um, is really important for couples and that involves in communication. And a lot of couples have a hard enough time talking about conflict that it doesn't involve sex, let alone talking about sexual conflict. And that's where we got to work through as therapists with our clients work through communication barriers because we should be able as a couple to talk about sex as easily as we talk about who's doing the laundry. Um, it should be an active part of your life and, or you want it to be. And if you're not talking about it, then you're probably not doing it. You know what I mean? So, um, we want to encourage that and not in some inappropriate or erotic way, but just like, Hey, like I got needs, you got needs. What are our needs? What do we like? What do we not like? Do we need a bells and whistle night or do we just need to get it done? Like, you know, having those kinds of real honest conversations are important for couples to have. Um, and assuming is our biggest enemy. We can't assume. Um, when you, when you assume you, like it says, you make an ass out of you and me, right? Not to be crass here, but that's what, that was a kind of a pun in itself. But, but that, but that is true, right? We, we assume, oh, well maybe to, like this or maybe that. And usually when we assume we get it wrong. And so trying to work with couples through that so that they don't miss each other anymore, um, that they can connect even as they are going through, um, all these transitions of raising kids and then they get to aging adults and that looks different, right? Our bodies change, women's hormones change. They go through menopause, which affects all kinds of things in a woman's body, um, to vaginal dryness, to probably sexual drive with, with men. We talk about sexual drive, um, you know, some issues with um, getting an erection, things of that nature, or holding an erection. Maybe the desire to have sex as often is it dwindles, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, especially if both people are at the same pace. Um, but I think it's talking about those things and that can be very embarrassing, you know, for a person to face that. Sometimes there's health conditions like prostate conditions, things of that nature that get in the way of intimacy, but you can't, you can have an intimate and physical encounter with someone and, and maybe that's not exactly penetration, but that doesn't mean it can't still be pleasurable and enjoyable. And so again, it's working with couples again, to talk about these hard topics, especially if an aging adult gets a really hard diagnosis where they have to make some pretty hard, um, decisions. The couple needs to talk about it because it's going to affect both of them and maybe what they thought their life would look like for the rest of their lives, you know, um, so it's really important for us to, you know, open that door of communication about sex. Let, let people know it's okay to talk about it. It's safe. They should be talking about it. Um, there's nothing wrong with talking about it. If anything is going to make the relationship better, that would be really, really important. Lastly, um, you know, people who are survivors of sexual trauma, whether it be in childhood or even as adults, um, it's important for par people when you know, assuming they feel comfortable to talk to their partners about it because there could be things that could happen in the bedroom that could be very triggering to someone. But if someone doesn't know it's triggering, they're going to probably keep doing it because they won't know. So it's important that we communicate what is triggering, what's bothersome. If there's a touch that doesn't feel comfortable or safe to talk about it so that the, so the sexual encounter can be comfortable and not take them back to a place where, um, things come up. 
it's important too for a person who has um prior trauma to probably have their own individual therapy work through that trauma if there's still residual ptsd potentially do emdr or other techniques to work through that but also work with their partner um quite openly and honestly about it so that they can find solutions and ways to be close with one another and be intimate with one another and not have um, the history come back up. Um, I've done work with people with EMDR over some past things and it's been very healing for them to be able to feel free of the past and be present in the moment when being intimate with someone. Um, Cause that's really important. You want your partner to be present with you. Um, and, and so some of that is maybe a person just finally even confessing past trauma. Maybe they felt embarrassed or ashamed. Um, and that's a huge burden to care. And like a victim shouldn't be carrying that burden. Um, if you were a child and somebody is doing something inappropriate to you, um, that's not your fault. Even if you had a pleasure response, that's not your fault. You can't control those things. Our body was designed that way. Um, and so, you know, carrying around that guilt and shame is not healthy for any current relationships and or healthy relationships. And so it's important for us to be able to help our clients be free of those things so that they can live a full and, um, healthy life with, how they want, um, sexually and not have that come into the forefront of their mind. Um, so anyhow, hopefully the reading and other material that you have this week will be helpful. Like I said, no live lecture next week because of the capstone. I look forward to reading the rest of your discussion boards. Um, I've enjoyed, um, reading your material over the course of the last few weeks. And I look forward to probably having you in classes again over the next few years while you're in the program. Um, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and I will talk to you soon. Take care.